morning, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Edible Education, our fourth class meeting of the year. And as you'll recall, this year we're focusing on the impact and legacy of UC Berkeley's food systems change makers, really trying to discern what is it about this special place, this university, this town that has attracted and shaped so many influential people who have over many years had a profound impact on the shape of the global food system. Um, I want a quick note for our um, graduate students. We want to have you meet down here at the end of class. We're going to finish a few minutes early, like about 5 to 8. Please come down here. We want to talk to you about how you're going to contribute to the um, greater benefit of the whole class with your final project. So if you're a grad student enrolled in the class, please come down. Alex, I don't know if we can get this monitor to work, but I, it's not on right now, so um, just probably has a faulty wire. So I may, you forgive me for like turning around and seeing what's happening. So a couple of uh, findings from the garden. Today I brought you uh, two varieties of oranges, the Valencia orange, uh, which was developed in California, in Southern California in the 1820s, and the this mammoth navel orange, you can see the navel, it's like a big belly button, also developed in California, named after Washington because somebody shipped a graft of it to Washington, D.C., and some politician opportunistically named it the Washington navel. Both of these, um, the Valencia original, originated in Spain, hence its name Valencia, and the navel uh, came from Brazil and some very talented fruit uh, hybridizers and gardeners and farmers had developed them and found out that in California they um, flourished. The Valencia is known for its juice, it's full of seeds. The navel has no seeds and is known for its easy to eat sectionality. And as you go to the market these days, you might catch different mutations or varieties of oranges that spring from combinations of these like the caracara orange and the blood orange and the pomelo and, and other fruits. Um, I also brought Michael, our, our special guest tonight, one of the Buddha's hands, another kind of intoxicating fruit of a different nature. Uh, I think Michael's garden at this point may be a little more intoxicating than mine, but maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, oh, I also wanted to show you, last week I showed you that bear uh, rose branch and this week it budded out. I took these pictures this morning and then over here on the left is believe it or not a plum tree already in blossom getting ready to fruit. I sent that to Mas Masamoto who you're going to meet in a couple of weeks and he immediately wrote back are you keeping track of the bloom because every year it seems to be coming earlier and earlier so us gardeners are becoming very attuned to the changes in the climate, the heat, the moisture that are um, precipitating earlier and earlier bloom in the garden. Uh, let's begin this week with uh, a dream. You know, we talked last week about vision and imagination, and I wanted to give you all a chance to practice visioning for a minute because this is going to be a key starting point for your final projects. So what I'd like to do is think about uh, I'd like you to kind of free yourself to dream, dream big about the food system that you envision, that you want to live in, that you want to inhabit, that you want to participate in. And a vision, as you know, is, is a dream grounded in action. So here's the exercise. What I'd like you to do is think about how to express and share your 10-year vision. This is not like an overnight success, but think about something that if you worked at diligently for 10 years, um, that you could create a meaningful transition or transformation in the food system. Here's kind of a, a, a suggested sentence. It doesn't have to be this way, but it would be something like, I have a vision for a local food system that provides the fresh, organic, regenerative produce to all of the schools in my community. 
that sounds a little bit like Alice's vision from a couple years ago, um, from a couple weeks ago. So think about this for a minute. If you want to make a note of it, because what I'm going to ask you to do in about 60 seconds is to introduce yourself to the person next to you. And if you're here with someone you don't know, um, or you're sitting next to a community member, that's even better for the students, so we can cross-pollinate a little bit. But I'm going to ask you to share your um, vision. And then I'm going to ask the listener, who's going to be very attentive to listening, to offer any suggestions about how to clarify it or even choose words that make it more vibrant or um, compelling. Because what we're trying to learn how to do is to frame and express visions that are uh, calls for other people to join and, and harmonize with. Okay, so turn to your partner and watch down here because I don't have a bell or anything. You're going to start talking. I'm never going to get your attention back. But I'm going to give you about three minutes to do this, for, to meet each other, introduce yourselves, and share your vision. Go. I know you wanted, I know you wanted more interactivity, so you got it tonight. As you know, um, we've been tracing the the uh, the learning journey in the class week. We started with um, Wendell Berry's guidance, learning about aesthetics and ethics, and then Marion came last week. Of course, Alice, of course, grounded us in the aesthetics of food, the deliciousness, the seasonality. Um, before I go any further, I want to introduce a very special guest who's here with us tonight, Naomi Starkman, who is the founder and editor-in-chief of Civil Eats and the gracious benefactor of the gift you all received of a six-month membership to this august publication, which I have the privilege of being involved with. Uh, Michael and Alice, obviously, as founding um, advisors and guides for this um, publication. So Naomi's here tonight. I'm sure she would be happy to meet you at the break and um, say hello. And if you want to thank her for all the great work that she and her team do to bring us um, really grounded pertinent, timely journalism. Um, I'm sure she would appreciate that. So thank you, Naomi. Um, you know, what we're really trying to do here is develop a sense of food systems intelligence. Over the last couple weeks, you've gotten a look at a number of systems diagrams. Um, we've talked about leverage points. What is food systems intelligence? It's really a way of perceiving these complex interdependencies um, that exist and those that are visible and that you might experience firsthand by say shopping or eating and those that are hidden and opaque and I like to think about could we use edible ed to develop the superpower of understanding to sort of peer through pierce through with a with a curious skeptical inquiring mind to see what's at work in the food system that's not readily visible. I showed you this diagram with the little leverage points. The leverage points are pretty easy to, um, to, to identify. Influences and their uh, ramifications or consequences are much more difficult. So tonight, with Michael's help, we're going to talk to you about power structures in the food system that have developed over decades concentration of power and the role it plays in the food and prices and in laws and legislation. I'd like to get into the true cost of food and also the systemic inequities that have played out so vividly in the, in the article uh, that we had you read that Michael wrote, The Sickness in the Food System, and of course, Marion's presentation last week talking about COVID and the way its impact has been felt um, so unevenly and so unjustly in many, many senses. So I wanted, um, you know, in this class to introduce uh, a land acknowledgement. And I also want to thank our, your former classmate, Francesca Hodges, for really encouraging the inclusion of a land acknowledgement 
into edible education. This is my seventh year. It'll be the first time I introduce this. Michael started this class 12 years ago. I'm not sure we included land acknowledgments at that time, but it's appropriate in this moment. And I thought I would take this opportunity to share with you a, um, an acknowledgement that was developed by the Native American Student Development Center here at uh, Berkeley. And they, this document uh, appears on the Native American Student Development Center website if you want to learn more. So here we go. Edible education takes place within and through the institution of the University of California at Berkeley, which sits on the territory of Hu Chin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We recognize that ourselves and every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since UC Berkeley's founding in 1868, a foundation that built over sacred Ohlone land, such as the areas we know as Faculty Glade and Strawberry Creek. The university still controversially holds 9,000 indigenous remains and about 13,000 funerary objects in the Hearst Museum of Anthropology. So as we lean into agriculture and regenerative practices in the weeks to come, it makes a lot of sense for us to honor and pay homage to the indigenous practices that inform a new world of regenerative agriculture a new old world, and, and also to recognize um, the, 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 you know, the, the ancestral roots of the place in which we um, now live and work. So thank you, Francesca. There's also more information available um, about this that I just want to point you to. There's a Sogorea so Te Land Trust website, and um, opportunities to actually participate by paying a land tax. All of this is going to be posted on B courses. So at your um, own curiosity, commitment, and discretion, I just encourage you to go deeper um, with this dimension of what it means to get an edible education. Last week, Marianne left us with this slide. It was, this was her recommendation slide. So what can you do about it, she said. She recommended this book about organizing for social change. She said to join organizations, don't start one. You're going to get a lot of competing and conflicting advice, by the way, this semester. Just count on that. It's a good thing. It's up to you to um, sort through it and figure out how it best applies to you. But one of our students, Alex, come on down here. Alex took this direction to use social media to heart. And uh, she turned our assignment this week into an Instagram story. So Alex, tell us the story um, well, of what do. you did. OK. Can you guys hear me? Yes. OK, perfect. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex. Uh, I'm a sophomore, and I am in society and environment. And after the quiz that we had last week, after Marion's presentation, um, which if you're not in this class, we had a quiz on food labels, basically looking at things like the USDA organic, uh, regenerative organic certified, all these kinds of food labels. So we had this little quiz, and I did it, and I was very inspired by it. I was like, after taking this class, I've been very inspired to, you know, be more conscious about the food that I'm purchasing and eating and consuming. And this felt like a really accessible thing that I don't think a lot of people know that much about, like understanding what your food labels mean. So after doing the quiz, I compiled this into a little Instagram infographic, as you can see, with different definitions of what, you know, certified, non-certified, no set standard, all those types of um, what those labels mean, because I feel like we can all kind of get confused by that, especially as Marion was talking, you know, food industries, greenwashing, and, you know, trying to get you to buy something that you think might be sustainable when it's not. So I took this opportunity. For me, this is just something small that I thought would make a difference, and I'm really thankful that Will 
is letting me share this with you guys. I post this just on my little Instagram called Action with Alex because I find that using my voice um, and sharing things on social media is really, really meaningful. So I guess the Follow moral- Follow Action with yeah. Alex. Follow Alex. it, please. <laughs> little Alex shameless now. little shameless plug, but- um, And don't forget to say hi to your folks because they're oh, watching. Oh yeah, for sure. Hi mom, hi dad. Okay. Let's have a big <laughs> um, hand for Alex. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much yeah. and thank you guys for your time. <laughs> So I, I just, I, I, Alex was actually thoughtful enough to write to us. She was so excited about this. She actually, the day after class, she had already done all this. She didn't wait a week. She did it and she said, is it okay if I post it or would you prefer if I waited a week so I don't give away all the answers to the quiz? <laughs> so if you wanna get the answers to future quizzes, just follow Alex's Instagram. And uh, thank you again, Alex. And. Um, now, without further ado, it's really my pleasure to bring to you uh, really the indisputable, most influential uh, voice in learning and talking and inquiring about food systems, uh, our very own Michael Pollan, who was the original course guide for Edible Ed 12 years ago. He just, despite how busy he is in the world, he always makes time for us here. And so let's have a warm welcome for Michael. There we go. Thank you very much. Hello, Will. Nice to see you again. I, I picked a poppy as a background. Ah, uh, thank us. you. I yeah. saw you had some psilocybin <laughs> mushrooms. Those were not edible <laughs> mushrooms in that picture. <laughs> Be careful. Shh, shh, shh. Well, can we talk about that for a minute? Because I, I read your Intoxicating Garden article, mm -hmm. and I noticed that it was published in the Financial Times in the UK. And that struck me as interesting because you're in the New Yorker and you're in the New York Times and the book review. And so was there something about the content of that article that was more resonant in the UK or? You know, I think that was one of those things that your publisher tells you is a good idea oh. to do. Um, <laughs> if, you're, if you're launching a book that is, might have some, get some static on the right, you're better off mm. introducing it to a, in a business publication. Like when I, when I published How to Change Your Mind, the launch article there uh, was in the Wall Street Journal. And it was hard to get it in there, but once I did, it sort of becomes a license for certain kinds of people to, uh, to pay attention to what you have to say. So it's kind of strategic more than, I mean, I don't even read the Financial I, Times I, or the Wall Street Journal. Right, I appreciate that. Well, we'll come, we'll come back to that strategy um, a little bit later, but most of you know for sure that Michael um, is a lifelong gardener at heart. He's followed his passion and curiosity. Um, his book, The Botany of Desire, was one of the most influential, inspiring books that I ever uh, read. How many years ago did you write that? 30 years? That ago? came out in 2001. Yeah, yeah. so 32 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Pretty amazing. And um, from there, you, you really, well, t can you tell the story about how, just maybe we'll start there. How did you come to Berkeley? How was it that you went, because you were living on the East I Coast. I was living on the East Coast, yeah. I was living um, first in New York City and then Northwest Connecticut, uh, where we moved when I decided to become a writer full time. And the key to becoming a writer full time is, is having very low monthly expenses, which we could do living in the country and sending our son to public school and all that kind of thing. Um, and I had a big garden there. And uh, all my work um, grows out of my experience in the garden. I mean, my interest in food, my interest in, you know, plants that change consciousness, it all starts with uh, thinking about what's going on in the garden. And, and in fact, my first book was a book of um, uh, in essays about my misadventures in the garden and what, what gardening had to tell us about the environment and the food system and all those kind of things. Second nature. Second Another nature, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that came out in sometime in the 90s, I guess. Um, so for me, that's where it begins. And you know, I can trace everything I've done from those early garden experiences. It's funny, I had the experience recently of rereading my first book, because authors don't go back and read their books unless they're forced to. And um, I, was, I was kind of uh, abashed, because uh, I, uh, the reason I read it is I was doing an audio book. It had come out before audio books and, and they wanted to do an audio book and I wanted to do it also, so I got to read it. And every idea I've had in the last 30 years is in that book. 
um, it was a little dispiriting uh, that I really hadn't had a new idea since 1991. <laughs> now they're in germinal form. You have to realize, you know, that these are just seeds and things would grow out of them. But there was the interest in consciousness change. There was an the interest in agriculture and there was the interest in soil health and it was all there. So they say this about first novels, you know, that you put everything you know into them. But what a great lesson for sort of um, concentrating your curiosity in a form. I mean, if you, if you think about it, if you think of those ideas as seeds um, and store them, perhaps they, they're going to germinate at different times. I mean, it took a, you, 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 you came back, I remember in your early 60s to revisit the consciousness alter, altering plants. Yeah, which um, I had written about in Botany of right, Desire. Yeah. Right, um, so yeah, I mean. I, I don't think, think I'm just spinning my wheels. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but maybe I, I am. I don't think so. Well, let's talk about some of your kind of seminal pieces, um, which we've assigned in other years in the course, and of course your books, The Omnivore's Dilemma and Food Rules, and um, let's get into this, uh, the power dynamics in the food systems. You, you had wrote kind of a, uh, an, I don't know if it was an expose, but you followed a, around this, this um, cow can, can you tell us that story and kind of what it yeah. revealed to you? That cow is actually why I got to Berkeley, as Alice will recall. <laughs> um, so when I uh, started writing about the food system, uh, again, I started in the garden and um, I wrote, uh, I had this, I was writing a column for the Times Magazine about what was going on in my garden. And this is in the late 90s. And I thought the, the big new thing was GMOs. They were just being introduced. I think they were introduced in 96. It wasn't that controversial here, but it was very controversial in Europe already. And I was kind of curious, is this a good thing, a bad thing? I really came at it with no preconceptions. And I had this idea, a cool, you know, I like to do immersive journalism where I participate in some way. Um, I would get some seeds from Monsanto and plant them in my garden and see what happened. And um, it kind of blew up into a larger, more journalistic piece for the Times that, um, uh, and I, um, did a lot of reporting at Monsanto and I visited these uh, potato farms where th their customers were using this. And it was really my first introduction to the scale uh, and chemical dependence of um, industrial agriculture. And I'll never forget going to this farm uh, in the Magic Valley of Idaho where most of our French fries come from. Um, and I was being escorted by a Monsanto minder to visit one of their uh, farmers. And the driveway was like, took a half hour to get, and it wasn't a dirt road. Um, it, this farm was so big, it was like 50,000 acres. And it had been divided up into these crop circles, 175 acres each. You see them when you're flying over the country and like, what are those green circles in the, in the brown desert? Um, but they're 175 acres each. And there is a irrigation pivot that is like a second hand on a, on a watch. And out of that pivot is coming the water and the fertilizer and the chemicals. And the farmer who I met was farming from inside this concrete bunker that they built. And every circle was represented on a computer screen. And he could tell how dry it was, what it needed. Uh, and he did it from there. And I asked him why he, why he farmed this way. It seemed like no kind of farming I'd seen. I mean, he was like in a cockpit, you know, adjusting dial. Uh, he said, well, we're using some pesticides that are so neurotoxic that you can't go in the fields for three days after you spray them. And it was a, it was a, uh, a pesticide called Monitor. It's actually off the market now, um, replaced by something very similar. And um, so, I, and in fact, if one of my irrigation pivots breaks, I will not go fix it in that three-day period because it's so dangerous. And then he took me to this, and this kind of blew my mind, um, and he was selling French fries that were going to McDonald's, and um, uh, he took me to this giant shed that they had built. It was the size of, you know, one of these indoor tennis courts that you see, um, and, and I, we went inside, and it was very cool, and it was atmosphere controlled, and there was a pyramid of russet Burbank potatoes that was um, two stories high, this giant pyramid of potatoes. And I said, what are the potatoes doing here? Why aren't they, why don't you sell them? 
And he said, um, well, you can't eat them right away because of the pesticides, the systemic pesticides. You have to let them off gas for six weeks, like a new carpet. <laughs> um, and that was kind of striking, especially since he served me potatoes right out of his farm for lunch. <laughs> um, Anyway, it, it was sort of like I had come from the East Coast and I didn't really have a sense of the scale of this agriculture. Um, and then on a subsequent trip, I found myself driving down Route 5 to interview somebody um, for a piece I was doing on organic agriculture. And I went to uh, Harris Ranch. I stopped at Harris Ranch. I don't know how many of you have passed that. Um, it's known uh, uh, familiarly to people in Coalinga where it is as Cowschwitz. Um, and it is, uh, you know, a giant feedlot right on the highway, um, 50,000 cows. And I was like, wow, so that's where, the, that's where the hamburgers come from. That's where the French fries come from. I had no idea. So I set out to write what became uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma. And this is a long answer to your question, sorry. Um, and uh, as part of that, in the same spirit of participatory journalism, I bought a cow, a steer really, and followed it through the whole meat system. If you want to see it, this piece is uh, on my website, michaelpollan.com. You can, you can just download it. It's called Power Steer. And that was a very, uh, that taught me a lot about how the whole system worked. Because um, I followed it from uh, the grass where they spend the first six months, which is kind of pastoral, idyllic situation, the same way cattle have lived for millions of years, well, thousands of years. Um, to the feedlot where they move when they're six months old and, uh, and, and live on a diet of corn and a lot of other weird things um, that they're given, various um, byproducts and all sorts of junk. And they get their hormone implant and they go on antibiotics uh, because the diet makes them sick. And, I, and that, that piece, um, actually, that, when I did my job talk to come teach at, at Berkeley, that was the piece I presented. And Alice was in the audience that day. I barely knew her. She's taking notes furiously. And she, she went back to the restaurant that, that day and said, that's it. We're only serving grass-fed beef. And she stuck to that at, at, uh, at great trouble and expense. Um, and they still only serve grass-fed beef there. Um, and I had talked about grass-fed beef as... Uh, superior from an environmental and health point of view. And I remember um, vividly, well, I remember two talks that you gave years ago. Um, one was all about oil, all the oil in the food system. And I remember you used to, talking about participatory, you used to demonstrate. I, I think you brought the oil yes. with you to show like how much oil is it's actually in a hamburger. In a hamburger. Yeah, I yeah. forget how much it is. It's like 32 ounces, though. It was a lot of oil. Now, how does oil get into a hamburger? Well, a couple ways. I mean, our, the industrial food system floats on a great lake of oil. Um, so that there is oil that is used to produce the fertilizer, to grow the corn, that, to feed the animals. Um, uh, nitrogen fertilizer is made from fossil fuel. You can make it from natural gas or oil or diesel, whatever you want, but it is, um, it, that's part of the carbon footprint of the, um, of the fertilizer. The other part of the carbon footprint of the fertilizer, and, and this very rarely gets enough attention, but uh, the nitrogen fertilizer, when you uh, spread it on fields, and it's, it's used most heavily on corn fields, um, the, the plants only take up some of it because the farmers put on too much. They put on about 70% more than they need because it's cheap and they consider it crop insurance. It's not cheap right now, but normally it's cheap. But as soon as that fertilizer that isn't taken up by the plant gets wet, it turns into nitrous oxide, which is a really serious greenhouse gas comparable to methane. So we are, you know, this is a big source of, uh, I mean, we all know that the food system has a, a, plays a major role in climate change, contributes about 25% of greenhouse gases, and one of the ways it does it is through the fertilizer. The oil shows up in other ways too, though. Um, you know, it's moving everything around. There's a lot of transportation. Um, and in several other ways, I can't remember right now because I haven't thought about this in 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> but the inputs are also subsidized um, yeah. heavily by the government, right? Well, animal agriculture, you know, when you buy a hamburger, you are not paying the full cost of that hamburger. I think it's really important to understand. Um, the uh, 
and if not just because it's a loss leader for McDonald's. Um, it is. They make their money on the sodas, uh, which are so cheap to produce, and everybody gets one with their, with their burger. But, um, you know, we allow the feedlots to pollute, essentially. You know, we have a Clean Water Act, and if you're a city of any number of people, you must treat your sewage before you release it into waterways. Um, and yet, for feedlots, which produce huge amounts of waste, there is no, no such requirement. They are exempted from the Clean Water Act. It's one of the many uh, important environmental laws from which we've simply exempted farming, including uh, animal welfare laws, by the way. Um, and so you're not paying for all that um, pollution that has to be remedied in some ways. Um, you're not paying you know, you, there's also the cost of the, 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 the workers, uh, not just in the feedlots, which don't have that many workers, but in the slaughterhouses. Uh, and the fact that many of them are undocumented, um, we, as we saw during COVID, um, horribly exploited. Um, it's, it's one of the most dangerous jobs in America. And, um, and, the, and yet they're not paid enough to support themselves to, to, so that most of them are on food stamps. So the taxpayer is subsidizing the, the slaughter, you know, Tyson and, and National Beef and all these companies. Our tax dollars are going to supplement their shitty wages. And um, so that's another cost of that burger that you never pay. And you can go through it. And uh, Raj Patel did a calculation once, and he claimed that uh, a burger really costs society about $300, I think he said. Um, and we pay, what, $3. Um, and that's, that's a huge problem. I mean, you know, let's say you accept all the premises of, of a market economy. Um, that's a big market distortion. Um, you know, and if we paid the, the true cost of meat, um, we would eat a lot less of it. Uh, and we would put out much, much, you know, less greenhouse gases and less exploitation. And, um, but when it's artificially cheap, there's no market signal that this is a, a truly precious product. So we, we know the numbers. Last week, Marion focused on some of the health outcomes, the d diet related diseases that are associated. Yeah, that's another cost. That's Thank another you. cost. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Um, but what, so we know all this, it's all logical. Why, why can't we fix it? And the irony of course, is that um, the government is subsidizing bad food in both, at both ends. So in other words, they are subsidizing high fructose corn syrup, essentially by subsidizing corn production, because that's where a lot of it goes. Lots of high fructose corn syrup in the diet, sugars of any kind, lead to type 2 diabetes. And then the government has to subsidize the care and the maintenance of people with type 2 diabetes, which costs about $400,000 per, per patient. Um, so we're, Last you night, know, President Biden made a big point of saying that insulin- They're capping insulin right, prices. Yeah, right. which is, uh, I mean, needs to happen, definitely. Um, so. It's, it's so irrational, I mean, that we are using, um, that our government is subsidizing uh, products and activities we know have a huge cost, both to public health and to the health of the environment. Um, and it tells you that, you know, the incentives are really screwed up. And we, uh, we were talking earlier about, you know, vision for uh, a food system, and this is a, a kind of a technocratic one, but one of the things I've really taken away from what we've seen in the last year or so with uh, legislation around energy and, and uh, climate change uh, and the most recent climate bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is really a climate bill, is that um, all you have to do is change the incentives. And, you know, capitalism is this big, dumb beast, and it will go wherever the guardrails and the incentives take it. And we just happen to have gotten them all wrong in food. And, um, you know, we see with electric cars, you know, there's a new subsidy for electric cars and there are various incentives for all the players. And like suddenly everybody on my street has an electric car. Um, change can happen really quickly if the incentives are right. There's a, a wonderful researcher named Phil Howard, who used to be at UC Santa Cruz. Now I think he's at uh, Michigan State. 
but Phil has mapped, he creates these great infographics. Maybe I'll bring one for you next week, but he's shown the consolidation of the food system and all the brands that you think you love. I, I had a career in the natural foods and specialty foods industry with a lot of idealistic entrepreneurs who wanted to change the world. And inevitably, our companies would grow to a scale of like a hundred million dollars. And then we were, you know, and we did a lot of things very creatively and scrappily. And I mean, you know, all these people, Gary Hirschberg and, you know, and then we get, and Greg Steltenpol, we get to this point where all of a sudden um, the margins are so small because of all those different costs of moving the food from the ground to the consumer. And, and the fact the supermarkets can, you know, tell you what price to take. Right. Because right. they're so powerful. Right. So inevitably, a lot of those companies were acquired by big food. Unilever bought Ben and & Jerry's. Yeah. And uh, I'll never forget the day I was working at Odwalla and Coca-Cola bought Odwalla. And I was teaching here and half the class was like dispirited. <laughs> you know, there goes the company. They were right, by the way. And another group was more like optimistic. Well, now maybe more people will have access to fresh juice. And we'll juice. change it. We'll change the system from inside. Yeah, that, that I've heard that one a lot. Right. I have yet to see it happen. <laughs> right. So I'm I'm just sitting here like 30 years later. Tell you know I told you my Republic of Tea story. Um, some of the companies that have managed to to kind of understand what the appropriate scale is for their business and not look at infinite growth, they're still, they still have the integrity around their business. And we talked about Republic of Tea and Patagonia Provisions. These are privately owned companies. They're yeah. not answering to Wall Street every week. But we haven't yet found um, a capitalistic model for these kind of values-driven companies to succeed and thrive and maintain their independence. No, um, and you know, and some of that has to do with the fact that um, there's so, such concentration. Uh, these companies are so large that um, you they're, you basically become a price taker. So the margins are so small, and the only way people can make any money is selling out to a bigger company that can command more shelf space too, because you have to pay for shelf space. There are things called slotting fees. So uh, if you have a product, not, not fresh produce, but anything in the middle aisles where you should stay away anyway, um, they, uh, um, you have to pay for that shelf space. And so that shelf space is controlled by big companies. Um, you know, Anheuser-Busch controls most of the shelf space for beer. And uh, so the microbreweries, the real microbreweries, have a lot of trouble getting, getting access to that. You know, the food industry is more concentrated today than it was in the, in the 1920s, um, in the era of the trust busters. Um, the, the, uh, in meatpacking, in grocery, and we used to break up those companies. And in fact, we have laws on the books that allow the government to break up those companies. Um, they're simply sitting there unused though. They have these powerful tools, but because these are the same companies that control Congress and exert a huge amount of, um, power in Washington, it's very hard to do. The Biden administration has made some noise in this direction and they've hired people who get it. Uh, the head of the um, FTC uh, is uh, a woman named Lena Kahn, who is an academic at Yale, who wrote brilliant pieces on concentration in the chicken industry and what it was doing to the farmers and the workers. I haven't heard from her, it's been two years. Uh, maybe she's like carefully developing a really powerful case or maybe she's been told to keep quiet. Um, I don't know the answer. She doesn't give interviews. She was working on tech, I know, for a while in yes. some of her. Yeah, and there's important work to right. be done on tech too. Um, but I think that this is, and you know, Obama made some gestures toward doing this. Um, and one of the great disappointments of the Obama administration, at least to me, was um, after he came in, so Obama kind of got the food issue. Um, and Michelle put it front and center on the White House lawn. Which was a so, way for him not to have to do as much. But, um, oh, and Michael, mean, Michael's, view, Michael's written a brilliant uh, critique um, of this. It's probably on your website too, right? 
that piece? Yeah, I forget what it's called, but yeah, right after Obama left office, I, I kind of reconstructed what happened. So um, the Obamas understood the food issue. Um, in fact, he had given an interview after Power Steer came out um, where he kind of summarized the whole argument in one incredibly eloquent paragraph of what was wrong with the food system based on that story. And then he got attacked. He by, raised our hopes. He we raised our he hopes, yeah. yeah. He got attacked, though, and, and then uh, by, by someone on the Ag Committee. And, sub, and the next day said, oh, I was just quoting something. I didn't mean I agreed with it. Um, but anyway, he, when he came in, he was going to uh, deal with concentration in the food industry. And he hired a very aggressive antitrust person, uh, Christine Varney. And um, both the Ag Secretary, Tom Vilsack, and his um, Attorney General, Eric Holder, had a listening tour in 2009 where they ran around the country listening to farmers. Farmers at great risk to themselves because they only have one company very often they can sell to. Like ranchers would get up there and say how the meat companies had divvied up the land so that only the, the territory, so there was only one person they could sell to, so they had to take whatever price they were getting. This is what happens, you know, in concentration. And they, and farmers testified great courage, and it was about seeds and meat packing and a couple other issues. And then the 2010 midterms came, and uh, Obama, you know, the Democrats lost the House, and Obama took what he called, uh, took a big shellacking, as he called it, and he had been depicted as anti-business. And uh, all the promises to deal with this issue were just dropped. Varney left, and that was the end of it. And he had, he had built up the hopes of farmers in the Midwest. And it's one of the reasons, I don't, I don't think people remember, but Obama won Iowa twice. Can you imagine a Democrat winning Iowa now? It's not going to happen for a generation. Um, and part of the reason was that he was speaking as a populist when he was there, what he was going to do to help the farmers. Uh, and I think that disappointment is one of the things that have soured farmers on government in general and led to their embrace of Trump and, uh, and their, you know, mass defection from the Democratic Party. So there was a cost to his chickenness. Mm. Um, and uh, yes, Michelle did a lot to highlight the issue. Um, I think she changed the conversation to some extent. She, she put in an organic garden in the White House, although she wouldn't call it an organic garden because that was too offensive to certain interests. But it was organic, she would tell people who toured it. Um, and uh, she made a contribution. And she did things around school lunch that were helpful. And there was some good stuff on food safety, semi-good stuff on food safety that was done. But in general, that administration was a great hope for reform that was not realized. So, so with the stranglehold that the big food uh, and the the big meat industry and with their enormous lobbying um, power, where, where, with your, where do you think the leverage points are for reform? Um, well, if we're thinking out 10 years, is there a way to you know, if you If you have the political will, there is, the laws are there, the same antitrust laws that allowed the government to break up uh, the meat trust, as it was called, and, and A&P, they're there. What happened was, under the Reagan administration, um, this theory got started that antitrust should only be uh, invoked if consumers are hurt, if prices go up because of concentration. And so it was a consumer-based decision. The word consumer is not even mentioned in the Sherman Antitrust Act. The idea was concentrations of power are bad for society regardless. And that you have to think about what this power does to the producers too, to the farmers. Um, and, and that is to say depresses their prices. Even if concentration leads to cheap meat, which it has. Um, would it be cheaper without it? I don't know. Um, so that, that's a memo that sits in the Justice Department, written in 1980, and that has guided antitrust ever since. All Biden has to do, or uh, uh, Merrick Garland has to do, is rip up that memo, um, and they can, they can prosecute these cases if they have the political will. 
But you're going to have to get money out of the food, out of the political system first, I think, before it will happen. This is, you know, this is this is more fruits of mm -hmm. Citizens United. Citizens United. Um, so I think I think that changing the power structure is is the hardest thing to do, even though the tools are just sitting there on the table. Um, I tend to think, um, you know, I, I've had this hope for many, many farm bills, but the farm bill is a very important point of leverage. And we're going through this, over the next year, we're going to be going through the farm bill process. And it happens, it doesn't get a lot of attention in the paper. If you read Civil Eats, you can stay on top of it, uh, or if you read the agricultural press. Um, but it's really important. These are the rules of the food system we all eat from. And they're usually left, these rules are left to be written by big uh, agricultural interests. And if more public and political light is shown on this process, if it gets more mm. attention, if there's more organizing around it, um, that can help. Uh, what gives me hope um, is that we also have some more powerful allies in Congress than we've had in a long time. I'm going to ask you about that. Um, yeah. Cory Booker totally gets it uh, on many levels about e equity and food access, but also about nutrition and about concentration. I mean, he sees the system. He, he gets it. And he, is, he did something really unusual. He's an urban senator from New Jersey who asked to serve on the Agriculture Committee which is usually left to you know, people from Iowa, maybe there's always a Californian because of all the ag here. And so there's been nobody representing eaters on the ag committee, and, and he is representing eaters. Um, John Tester is also a, a powerful ally. He's a farmer, uh, organic farmer, and he has managed to, to remain politically viable in a state that went like 70% for Trump. Um, and he's very popular and he's a, a populist and he gets it and so and then there's a bunch of people in the house so we're building some political power um, but I think Booker's getting on the Ag Committee is a, is a signal event we'll see what he does with it right but overall how would you rate the food systems intelligence of Congress oh Sub-zero. Yeah, sub-zero. <laughs> yeah. Like the refrigerator. Yeah, no, I see. Um, I, I, I wonder about that. I see so little. It's, you know, it's been treated as a parochial issue. Mm, mm. And so there's certain issues you just leave to that industry or those people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it hasn't been seen as a national concern. With systemic impact. Yeah. Yes. And so uh, it hasn't gotten a, a nearly enough attention. Um, you know, I've, always, I've been lobbying, as long as I've been working on food issues, for calling it the food bill and the food committee, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. the ag committee, because who cares about agriculture? Most people don't. Um, it's an abstract thing. We only have two million farmers in this country. Uh, people don't know farmers anymore, you know, in general. Um, but it is a food bill because it affects the way we eat and has a huge effect on public health and on the health of the environment. And those two lenses, if you brought either of those lenses to it and said, let's score this bill, not on what it's going to do to farm income, or, but let's score it on what it's going to do to the environment if we set up these subsidies and this insurance system this way. And what is it going to do to public health? Um, and in the same way we have a CBO score for any you know, bill, what it's going to do to the deficit. If we scored these bills and we saw that by creating this new crop insurance system, we are going to increase our greenhouse gas production by X, that would make it harder to pass that bill. Um, so I could imagine some NGO getting started that had the expertise to do that kind of scoring. Uh, and that as these drafts were being written, uh, kept publicizing um, what this bill means. because. You know, of all the legislation that moves through Congress, um, I don't know the, that an, there's another bill quite as influential for, for our health, for our public health. I'm sure Marion talked about this last week, um, but, you know, it, it, what kills most of us are chronic diseases linked to diet. And um, it's, a, it's an enormous problem. Um, we spend, I think, three quarters of 
healthcare spending goes to chronic disease. Now you take out alcohol and uh, cigarettes and you still have, um, you know, it's half a trillion dollars. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. Um, th these chronic diseases, and I'm talking about diabetes and heart disease and several different types of cancer and stroke are directly related to the way we're eating. And the way we're eating is directly related to the way we're subsidizing agriculture and the way we're organizing the rules of the food game. How is that? Well, we have a subsidy system that makes commodity crops like corn and soy um, so cheap. Um, in other words, farmers generally sell these crops below the cost of production. How can they do that? because they're getting subsidies. 40% of farm income comes from us. Um, we're paying farmers. So we should get what we need from farmers, um, but we're not. So the price of commodities is so low relative to the cost of producing them that not only does the farmer have trouble making money, but the only way to make money is to process those cheap commodities. You can't sell corn as corn, but you can sell it as soda and make a lot of money. So the food gets more and more processed, um, and the term that's being used is ultra-processed. Um, and that's become a very important part of the food conversation that's fairly new. Um, uh, there was this uh, epidemiologist in, in Brazil named Carlos Monteiro, whose work is really interesting. And he uh, was trying to figure out why obesity rates were going up so fast in Brazil. Um, and he looked, and, and, and actually consumption of fat and protein and um, sugars hadn't changed that much. What had changed is the form in which people were getting these foods. They were not getting them from home-cooked meals, even unhealthy home-cooked meals. They were getting them from ultra-processed foods. What is an ultra-processed food? It's any, did Marion talk about yes. this? Okay, so you know. Uh, an ultra-processed food well, she, is, she is should, made, ma right. made from ingredients no ordinary person has in their pantry. Right. You couldn't cook, you couldn't make it at home. She um, shared with us the um, study that showed that people that were eating ultra processed foods were actually eating 500 more, more calories, calories a day. Yeah. But this, th this is a great segue to food rules because I imagine with the way your writing and your books uh, illuminated all these complex interdependencies, people were saying, so tell me what to eat. Yeah, and well, I wrote a book trying to simplify that for right. people because it is simpler than you would think if you read a lot of nutrition science, uh, which, you know, journalism has an interest in complicating things sometimes. Um, and, um, uh, and nutrition science is complicated and it, it seems to be changing all the time. Marion says it isn't, but I think it really does. And um, so we hear that, you know, we should worry, you know, are we getting enough protein? Carbs are evil, but, you know, when I was younger, fat was the great evil, and you had to stay away from fat. But paleo people love fat. They're fine with it. And, and suddenly you have a very confused consumer. And next week, Christopher Gardner, who is the expert in Good. diets, will be here Excellent. to follow up. On he's, your a, he's a very important voice. Um, so I tried to write a book um, because I was doing a lot of public speaking about food, and everybody would say, yeah, cut to the chase. What should I eat? Um, so I tried to, so I did this deep dive into nutrition science and I spent months, this was for, originally for a New York Times piece, um, trying to figure out what do we know about the links between diet and health. And it came down to seven words. Um, eat Most food. Most often quoted. Yeah, often quoted this will words. be on my tombstone unless I can improve <laughs> on it. Um, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And that really is all you need to know. Now, eat food is a little complicated. It's true because all this crap is sold as food. But I had, so, so I developed a set of, of uh, sub rules to help you navigate. So, you know, don't buy foods that have more than five ingredients or have ingredients you don't have in your pantry or have ingredients your third grader can't pronounce. Um, uh, and or, or you know your shop grandmother in the wouldn't recognize or that you're yes the, or <laughs> don't eat foods your grandmother wouldn't recognize that became complicated though yeah <laughs> my grandmother eats the junkiest food um so you can't count on the grandmothers anymore <laughs> well we're we are so grateful for that um haiku i think it's very easy to remember and provides a lot of guidance and i've been asked uh, you know about it you know would you change anything 
And I've thought about it, and I don't think so. I mean, I think what, what does it mean to eat food is a, is a somewhat moving target. Um, mostly plants was, the word mostly, that adverb was the most controversial because uh, meat eaters thought they'd been dissed, or I dissed meat, which I had. And, but vegans and vegetarians, like, what's with this mostly? Why not go all the way? <laughs> and at the time, I couldn't find a good health argument for eliminating meat from the diet. I, I think it's, you know, it's healthy food. I think, you know, we eat way too much of it. Um, and there are many reasons not to eat meat, um, but looking at it strictly through the lens of health, uh, eliminating it um, because it's, you know, going to make you sick if you're eating a, a small amount of it is like, I, c I couldn't justify that message. So I stuck with them mostly, you know, but we're in an environment where reasonableness doesn't get you very far. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a short break. We'll take a 10 minute break. Um, if you, you, we'll come back and invite you to, um, into conversation with Michael. There's two microphones here. You're welcome to step up. And then there's also our um, sheet over here on the wall with sticky notes if you'd rather have me sort through your question and um, give it to Michael. And maybe Michael will share a little bit about his master class for us. So see you in 10 minutes. I want to invite anyone who wants to ask a, a question to come to one of the microphones and we'll call on you in a second. But just to get started, it would be fun, Michael, to hear about your new master class on intentional eating. Yeah, I think I see who has my orange. <laughs> somebody, somebody took those last two oranges there. How is those it? were for Michael. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I could just have a section. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I've been working this 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 past year on two food-related projects. After you know leaving to write about other things. Um, the, and one, you, one is out already, and that is a master class. Anyone familiar with master class? It's a streaming service. Uh, and they asked me to do a class. Uh, Alice has done one, too. She, you can find her on there. Oh. And, and uh, a bunch of interesting food people. Ron Finley is on there, and um, uh, a lot of chefs. Um, anyway, I did one on intentional eating, which is something I, I gather you've been talking about, which is, how do you align your values with your food choices? Um, and sometimes there are conflicts. Um, and so I, I, it's, a, it's a really a class about how, to, how you navigate that. Because um, people often ask, what's the best way to eat? And the answer has to be, well, what's important to you? Is it the environment? Is it the welfare of animals? Is it your health? Is it uh, you know, climate change? And each of those values, or is it social justice? Each of those values implies, sometimes they overlap and you can, you can hit, uh, you know, the same food can, can cover a lot of different values, but often they're in, in some tension. Um, and uh, so it's, it, it's a, a class really about that, how to navigate that. Um, and um, unfortunately you have to pay for master class, um, but maybe your parents have a subscription, you can borrow the password. Um, <laughs> And then the other project I've been working on is a sequel to Food, Inc., uh, the documentary that I worked on in 2008 with Eric Schlosser. And that should be out, I guess, toward the end of the year. Tell us a little more about that. I mean, Food, Inc. was a seminal documentary to expose factory farming and... Yeah, um, and, well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, that documentary, how many people saw Food, Inc.? Oh, my God. Um, you guys are hardcore. Um, <laughs> so... Ever since that documentary came out, they've been asking us, participant, the, the company that produced us, to do a sequel. But nothing had changed that much, and it didn't seem justified. Uh, and so we kept saying no. But when COVID hit, um, it's interesting, on the same day, you read that piece of mine, uh, The Sickness in Our Food Supply, from the New York Review of Books. The very same day, Eric Schlosser, unbeknownst to me, published a piece in The Atlantic about what was going on with the uh, meat workers uh, and COVID. And Robbie Kenner, the director, saw these two things and realized, OK, there is something new going on here. Um, and that is uh, what COVID has revealed. COVID was one of those crisis points that pulled back the curtain. And we understood certain things about the food system that um, 
didn't, you know, people, people like me and Marion and Eric have been saying, and Alice have been saying the food system is broken, but it didn't look broken to people. Um, there was still plenty of food in the supermarket, plenty of, you know, you could find cheap things to eat. The whole system was kind of moving along on its efficient track, but COVID destroyed that illusion. Um, and, it, and it showed us that these gains in efficiency that have been achieved by the food industry, by industrial food, uh, came at a cost, and, and one uh, many costs, but one of the key costs was resilience. This was not a resilient system. And it had to do with concentration and specialization, companies d dividing up the marketplace. So for example, um, uh, well, you remember the toilet paper so shortage. This is not a food example exactly, but um, what was that all about? Well, it was the fact that um, people were using bathrooms at home rather than at work or in institutions. So the companies that made those giant rolls of toilet paper for like public restrooms um, were not selling any toilet paper, but they only knew how to make rolls this big. They didn't know how to make rolls this big. And, so you, and, and the same happened with like eggs. So the companies that would sell restaurants and corporations eggs in lots of 64 or whatever, these giant trays, didn't have the equipment, didn't have the cartons to, um, to make eggs in 12 packs or six packs for the supermarket. And they didn't even have relations with the supermarket because they were on this other, they were you know, in this industrial marketplace. And this happened across the way. And it's the only way to understand the fact that the shelves for a period of time were getting emptied in supermarkets at the same time farmers were throwing out food. Uh, and I remember this imagery of um, euthanized pigs because if you, the, the, um, the industrial market for pork dried up and um, you can't keep pigs around um, you know, another two weeks because they grow so fast and they're too big for the slaughter system. So they had to kill them all and just bury them in mass graves. Um, yet there was not a lot of pork in the supermarket and that's because it was these two markets. Milk too, milk was getting spilled out and there were no cartons of milk because the companies that make the giant cartons that you know, in your cafeteria don't know how to make a little carton. And so we saw the brittleness of this system the other thing we saw, and that we talk about at length in the film, is the power of the meatpacking companies. Um, COVID was really a problem in meatpacking. You have people working indoors very close together, you know, touching each other on these lines, cutting up meat. Everybody has one little job, one knife cut, and it's cold, and, um, and they were getting COVID at very high rates, and people were dying who worked in meat plants. And the local public health authorities tried to close down meat plants. Um, and the companies just didn't want to close their lines. So John Tyson, and this was, a, this was a signal moment, I think, in American political history. John Tyson took out an ad in the uh, New York Times and I think in the Wall Street Journal, an open letter to President Trump saying you know, that you know, the shelves were going to be empty unless they reopened uh, and, and urged him to use the Defense Production Act a law that exists, well, I won't go into the history of it, but this is not what it's designed for, um, to use that to force the company to open their production lines. Um, and lo and behold, within four days, President Trump signed an executive order forcing uh, the, the lines reopen uh, and putting workers in danger back. So when you have a situation where a single company can force a president to do something against all the public health best information, you have too much power. If you need an argument for antitrust enforcement, that's all you need, that's all you need. So, so we're looking at what we learned about the food system, um, but there's, it's also not quite so bleak. I mean, there's some very hopeful, as there was in, in uh, the first Food Inc. Of, of innovators, change makers, who are doing some really interesting farming, fishing, um, and oh, that's good to hear. I was I know, waiting for the worried. hopeful punchline. But I have to say, we struggled with the hopefulness. Um, and I, I strongly believe, and I do this in my writing, if you can find hope in any subject, you need to include it. Like when I wrote Power Steer, I fought tooth and nail for like three paragraphs about grass-fed beef. 
at a time when it was a very tiny market. But I knew people would read this article and like have nowhere to turn. So I wanted to point to something hopeful. And I had a fight with my editors to keep it. Um, and, uh, and the same goes with this. I, I, think it's, I think it's very important to offer people hope in journalism if you can do it. And a lot of journalism doesn't, of course. And a lot of journalists think that that's kind of namby-pamby to do. Um, that, you know, investigative reporters really are dark figures in their, <laughs> in their worldview. And they're often very happy to leave you in despair. Um, well, maybe I'm not talk, like that. Yeah, you're not. <laughs> well, and and um, you've kept your wits about you. I mean, you could get really frustrated after, you know, stumbling onto these big issues 20, 30 years ago. And like you said, oh, my God, it's the concentration of power is worse now than it was. Well, I am frustrated. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely frustrated. And it, it, is that why you turned to intoxicating <laughs> plants? Or? That's why I started tripping. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but, I was, it, but I, was, I was excited about moving into an area where um, progress is happening really swiftly, which mm -hmm. is to say the recognition of the potential of psychedelics to heal mental illness um, and that there's there don't seem to be any powerful interest standing in the way so things are moving very quickly so it's an interesting contrast huh. so um, you know it's nice to work in an area where you feel progress being made are you rapidly. get you getting a hit of that it's oh, pretty it intense smells isn't so it? good yeah um, you're gonna give me a lesson on how to eat it <laughs> I don't want to turn away from hopefulness but I did read an uh, an op-ed the other day that we, we do have another egg shortage right now and it's yeah, not COVID related, flu. it's because of bird flu. And you know, basically the scientists are saying we're this far away from another pandemic because- this Yeah, because when bird flu ha just has to acquire a, a gene or two um, and, and bird flu's already uh, spread to mammals. In minks. Minks have it. Yeah. So it's getting closer and that's really scary. Um, but I think it's also, you don't hear enough about how the system and the way we're growing chickens is contributing to bird flu, which is obviously monoculture. We haven't talked about monoculture, but you know, if there's an original sin in agriculture, it is monoculture. Because when you have vast uh, chicken houses, um, it's a breeding ground for diseases. Uh, in the same way, vast fields of corn are breeding grounds for weeds. Uh, the, the pest has a banquet, you know, endless banquet. Whereas if you diversify and you have not just chickens, but chickens and pigs and cattle, uh, you're going to break that chain of transmission. And, um, but that's not what we have. So, you know, you're playing with fire when you grow lots of animals in a, in a small contained area. Um, and it, it's, there's a very good chance that whatever the next pandemic is, it will begin in an industrial animal operation. Who's got some questions? Did you, did you have a question too? So you come first and then Nick, introduce yourself real quickly. And uh, if you're a student here, tell us what you're studying. Hi, Michael. Hi. My name's Nick. I'm studying basically development economics. Um, and my question's about demography. So in the US with less than 1% of the population in farms and almost all of the farm labor being immigrant labor. A lot of our paradigms for growth internationally are related to moving people out of agriculture and into more high income positions. So I'm, my question is related to, do you see a future for an agriculture like that where such a small fraction of people work? And if not, what does a sustainable, more inclusive agriculture look like? Thanks. Yeah, I, that's a great question. Um, and I haven't worked that much on international uh, agriculture issues, but I think a couple questions have to be answered. I mean, do people want to leave farms for these more highly, supposedly highly paid urban jobs in developing countries? I don't know the answer to that. Nobody's asking them. Um, this, this is a World Bank vision um, or an IMF vision. Um, I also think we, uh, we forget that at present, 70% of the food produced in the world is produced by peasant farmers. Um, it's still how most of the food gets produced. Um, and I think that it would be uh, radically destabilizing um, to bring industrial techniques 
um, especially if they weren't requested or wanted, to these places um, to bring, uh, you know, fertilizers and um, hybrid seeds. I mean, there is a, you know, there's an effort that um, the Gates Foundation has been promoting to essentially industrialize developing world agriculture. Um, it seems to me taking people off the land is a, a very momentous step, should not be decided, you know, half a world away, and um, could have um, incredibly destabilizing effects in these countries. Um, there's so many stories about um, uh, peasant farmers adopting, um, you know, GMOs, for example, and bankrupting themselves, getting into debt to buy fertilizer, um, to play the whole game. And the problem is that we, we encourage these farmers to use modern techniques and modern seeds, but then we go ahead and dump our surplus agricultural products on these countries and bankrupt those farmers. You know, we have a, a, a law in America that food aid, uh, when we're feeding a, 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 a place in the world where there's um, malnutrition or starvation, that um, it, we must, food aid must come in the form of American food exported. So we can't give them money to buy food locally, which would stimulate local agriculture. Um, we have to send them corn from Iowa on American ships. And that's the terms of food aid. And so that move itself, it might feed people in the short term in a moment of crisis, but you're, you're, you're pulling the rug out from under the local farmers who can't compete with subsidized American grain. So. I think that whole question has to be addressed with in incredible sensitivity to local conditions, culture, uh, the desires of the people involved. If you want to read more on this issue, Raj Patel is the author I would recommend. He's, um, is he coming this year? He came last year, Raj came, and if you want to see his class, you can watch it on the Edible Schoolyard Project He website. knows a lot more about this than I do, and he spent, he's done a lot of field work in Malawi and um, has it, a very interesting perspective on it. His this. classic book was called Stuffed and Starved that addressed this. Over to you. Hi, um, my name is Anthony Neil Tan, and I'm a fourth year bioengineering student, um, and I'm on a gap semester. I'm creating my startup, which is on vertical farming. Um, I wanted to revisit the conversation about um, monoculture because I think it's a really huge issue. Um, I took this class um, with uh, Professor Kristen Rasmussen um, at uh, Food Culture Environment, and she discussed how like, the food that we need to eat is the food that our ancestors ate. It's the food that's our cultural cuisine. So for example, um, people from Norway, they don't get high blood pressure after eating a lot of salt because that's just how they grew up. All their foods are preserved with salt, and it, like for me, if I eat like high sodium diet, I will get high blood pressure. So it's just a matter of figuring out how can we create more sustainable um, food system that caters towards our individual like cultural needs. Um, because going to McDonald's and eating the ultra processed um, fast food will lead to those chronic diseases that we see today because there's not one size fits all. Um, so I was thinking there's a lot of conservation resource um, uh, money and grant that's coming from um, government that's going to like conservation of like native plants. But what if that money is taken and put into culinary herbs? I've been watching a lot of Chef's Table recently and I see that there's a lot of like these um, Michelin star um, or like, you know these amazing chefs. It doesn't matter who cares if they're Michelin star or not. But what they're doing is that they're taking herbs from their cultural cuisine and putting it into the dishes and that's food that people love and they enjoy and it's healthy, it's sustainable. Um, so I'm wondering if there's any companies that are out there that are taking this conservation resource um, money and putting it towards growing these native herbs in a sustainable way and in a way that um, can be easily um, brought to these restaurants. Yeah, I don't know of any companies doing that, but the general point you raise about the importance of food culture is um, it can't be emphasized enough. You know, food cultures are repositories of knowledge, and a lot of that is nutritional knowledge. Um, I would not be surprised if the Norwegians are eating something else that counteracts the effect of salt on their metabolism, on their blood pressure. Um, food combinations 
uh, often have very important health effects. And that these combinations and their value um, were discovered, you know, strictly by trial and error, you know, from hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Um, an example I remember reading about, you know, we, we, we think science has the last word on nutritional wisdom, but it doesn't. I remember reading an article a couple years ago, and it was like a big discovery that um, the lycopene in tomatoes, which is a very important antioxidant, was unavailable to your body unless it was uh, served with fat. So putting olive oil on tomatoes, something that Italian grandmothers figured out a long time ago, turns out to be the best way to access the lycopene. So that's cultural knowledge that um, embodies nutritional wisdom. And um, it's something that Americans are deficient in or have been deficient in because for, ver for various reasons, one of which th that we're an immigrant nation composed of many different people who came here with very different food cultures, we don't have a deeply rooted food culture, one deeply rooted food culture. Now that's a strength in some ways, but it's a weakness in others. And it's one of the reasons that we change the way we eat every generation. I, I was, I've been struck by the fact that like, I don't eat, I don't cook the way my mother cooks, uh, cooked for us in the 60s and that was not the way her mother cooked for her and the diet keeps changing, influenced by, you know, restaurant fashion or marketing. Uh, from industry, you know, so you can, you know, we, we move with the wind in, in what we eat and what's lost in doing that, yes, there might be lots of novelty, but what's lost is some of that nutritional wisdom. So I think efforts to preserve uh, food cultures and pay attention to them and, 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 and try to figure out why they work the way they do, um, you know, uh, how you can, you know, there, there are lots of recipes that make complete proteins out of vegetables, for example. Nobody knew about, you know, amino acids and essential fats and things like that, but they figured it out. Um, so I think it's a great focus. Um, in terms of farms growing specialty crops like that, the best example I saw of this, and somebody should do this in the Bay Area, I went to visit a, uh, a kind of an allotment garden set up in the south side of uh, Chicago, and everybody was, you know, had their plots, and they were, you know, they were farmers. They each had like a half acre or something, and they were selling into farmers markets. And everybody was growing the same, like tomatoes and squash and, you know, the usual crops and lettuce and stuff. And there was this one woman who, was, who had all these plants I didn't recognize. And I said, what are you growing? And she says, I'm growing herbs for the cocktails, for bartenders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she had a booming business um, because there's, a, you know, big fad for cocktails and they're making their own bitters and all this kind of stuff. So... Finding a niche is the way to go. I once looked at a, um, uh, an investment opportunity that was an aquaculture company that was um, farming tilapia. And above the tank was um, high value herbs like mm -hmm. basil and what chefs would use to, um, you know, for fresh. And the, the water from the fish was recirculated through the right, herbs to nourish the herbs. The, I've seen yeah, the, so that was an like interesting yeah. kind of system. Yeah. Anybody else have a Thanks question? Thanks for sharing. Yeah, come on down. Oh, you guys are up there too? You gotta be assertive. Yeah, all right. How well, do we'll I know? I can't see, you're just sitting there. Come on down, you gotta stand there, wait your turn now over and here. And look impatient. Yeah, look impatient, yeah. All right, well. Okay, quick, quick, yeah. That last question was an example of how not to ask a question. I'll be quick. Three okay. sentences. Ooh, sorry <laughs> about that. I don't, I mean, it's just a question. Sure. Yeah, um, okay. I'm Saskia Verstig, by the way. I'm a visitor. Thank you for opening up the class to visitors. Um, you talked a lot about the social cost of animal agriculture tonight, both for producers and for people in slaughterhouses. Um, and the scale is tremendous. Even just in the U.S., 40% of land is used for grazing and growing feed. Two million people are involved in or employed by the livestock industry. So it seems to me a lot of momentum to have to shift if you want to shift to a more plant-based system and a lot of people to involve in a just transition path or a fair transition path. So what kinds of programs or incentives would you be thinking about looking forward that give you hope that that transition path can be realized, whether it be policy or business or something like that? Uh, I'll just give you one example. Um, you know, we have a very sharp division now between people growing plants and people growing animals. And um, I think the most sustainable systems involve both. 
Um, and that, you know, this is a, a lesson that Wendell Berry uh, teaches, and that um, in nature you always have plants with animals. And on, a, on, the, on the most sustainable farms I've ever seen, um, the plants are feeding the animals, and the animals with their manure are feeding the plants. And that, that's a, um, a virtuous uh, circle and cycle. And he's got a very funny line about um, when, we took the plant, when we took the animals off the farms, we took a solution and neatly divided it into two problems, <laughs> 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 which is a wonderful line. And uh, there was um, a nutrient deficit on the farm, on the plant farms, and then there was a waste problem on the animal farms. And if you get it right, you don't have these problems. So. Um, but there are enormous impediments to farmers who want to bring animals back onto their farms. Um, there's a, a person, um, a guy we profile in, in the New Food Inc. Um, his name I'm forgetting, but he invented something called a stock cropper. And it is a solar powered movable pen in which he, uh, on one end he's got pigs, on the other end he's got chickens that on its own power moves very slowly through his cornfields, harvesting the corn, feeding these animals, and at the end of you know, X number of weeks, he's fattened these animals uh, without having to harvest his corn or send it off somewhere. But his challenge is where does he get these animals slaughtered? Because, we, because of, again, consolidation, I, I hate to he keep hitting this point, um, if you, Tyson is not going to take your, your lot of 10 pigs. Um, they're, they're, they have their own pigs. So you need more local slaughterhouses, USDA, USDA inspected slaughterhouses. It's not in the interest of the USDA to send inspectors to a, a, a plant that's only processing, I don't know, 10 animals a day. It's more efficient for them to send that inspector to a place that's doing 50,000 head of cattle a day. Uh, or some crazy number. Um, so uh, that would be one way to help with that transition. It would bring some, if, if, if it were really easy for farmers to get small lots of animals, and these are animals raised on the proper food and uh, a much more humane life, um, if they could get those animals slaughtered more easily, you would see some movement uh, toward the, the objective we're talking about. One of our students uh, about two years ago in the Food Innovation Studio class developed a business plan for mobile uh, Houses, slaughter yeah. housing. Yeah. And there's been and some it, USDA support for that. It's, and I, I've seen it in certain communities, mm -hmm. and it, it definitely helps, but it's, it's pretty small oh, bore solution. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your patience. Yeah, of course. Michael, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I really like that last question because it ties really nicely. Um, I actually just came from a uh, grazing tour by the UCANR on grazing and almond and vineyards. So it plays nicely. But um, my question is related to your topic about capitalism being a big, dumb beast and just following the money. Um, one of the recent things we saw last fall was the USDA pour about $3 billion into climate smart um, partnerships. So people trying to develop climate smart projects, research to kind of like get farmers, get researchers, get folks thinking about these issues so that we can begin to kind of link um, carbon reduction or carbon removal to agriculture. And then we also see this gigantic boom in the carbon market. Um, I don't know if anybody here has seen the John Oliver piece on it, but it's being talked, out, talked about a lot right now. And so I'm really curious to see or hear your point of view on how all of this hype and momentum and just it's all kind of coming together all at once. Like, where do you see this going? And does this tie into kind of capitalism following the money? Because there's a lot of money in companies trying to buy carbon offsets or reduce their scope three emissions and drive it down that way. Yeah, so. it's a great question. Um, you know, I think we have to be very careful of terms like climate smart agriculture. Um, are, they, are they real? Um, there are things, Naomi's uh, Civil Eats ran a really good piece the other day uh, pointing to two programs in the um, Inflation uh, Reduction Act that are going to go backwards on climate smartness. Yeah. Um, they're climate dumb. I mean, one is, <laughs> one is um, ethanol, okay? Like 20% of the corn crop now goes to make ethanol, and this is considered a renewable um, fuel. 
And you know, there's a law, 10% of uh, gasoline has got to have ethanol in it, which is fermented corn product. Well, if you look at the energy that goes into making ethanol, it takes a lot more energy than you get out of it. Um, and, uh, and if you count the, the carbon impact of the fertilizer um, and the distilling and everything, you're, you're like way behind. I mean, it's a joke. It, the only reason we have ethanol is because we have too much corn. So rather than wean us from ethanol, yet it still has an image as, as a renewable fuel. And they will need some kind of renewable fuel for uh, airplanes, uh, which is true. I mean, it's a very hard thing to get, uh, get planes off of carbon, jets off of carbon. Um, but there is, so there's a big incentive under this climate smart agriculture for, um, I, I forget the amount, but another huge increase in ethanol to, to basically bail out this dying industry. So you have to scrutinize every line. Is it really climate smart? Or is it just another way to throw money at agricultural interests? And I think that's often the case. Um, we have to incentivize farmers to sequester carbon. Absolutely true. We don't exactly know how to do that yet, or, and we don't know how to measure it very well. Um, yep. <laughs> that's really important work to be done. Um, it's possible. We've seen it. But you know, how long is that carbon going to stay in the soil? Um, is uh, you know, there are people who say you can do it through rotational grazing, and there are people who say you can do it through cover crops. And um, um, but it's also going to be very different in different regions and different soil types. It's really complex. Um, so I'm just a little worried that some of the money is ahead of the ideas, um, and that uh, it, it needs to really be scrutinized. Get a couple more questions in here. Thank you. Hi. Um, you mentioned earlier about the importance of the farm bill, and I know that it's being rewritten within the next year. So I was just wondering what you would like to see in the next rendition of the farm bill, and also how you build um, like people power to have more political will around changing those programs. Yeah. Well, I've got, you know, the farm bill is such a hodgepodge. There's so many different things in there. I mean, food stamps are in there, too, uh, or SNAP payments, as they're now called. Um, and WIC is in there, I think. And um, uh, so there's so many issues on the nutrition side. Actually, most of the spending in the farm bill is on nutrition programs. Um, how are those programs structured? What are you allowed to buy? What are you not allowed to buy? All that is areas where there could be improvements. Um, there's always a debate over whether you should be able to buy soda with your SNAP dollars. Who are, who are, who are you to say we can't? Why are we subsidizing soda? You know, these are the kinds of issues. Um, so I don't really have a blueprint. Um, I did write a piece uh, co-authored with um, Mark Bittman and um, Ricardo Salvador a few years ago, um, which laid out what a food, what a, what a progressive food policy would look like, and that's on my website. Um, but I definitely, you know, more than any particular um, programs, it's it's bringing that lens. Like, how would you organize the incentives if you really wanted to encourage more healthy food? You know, more than ninety percent of the subsidy dollars goes to commodity crops, which are the building blocks of fast food, of fast food and ultra processed food. How would you? Uh, and yet we all know what we should be eating is you know fresh fruits and vegetables, or even frozen fruits and vegetables, or can any kind of fruits and vegetables. And uh, so how could you how could you incentivize farmers to grow more of that? Um, it's actually not easy because if you sim whenever you subsidize something, you get overproduction. And overproduction of corn is no problem or wheat because you can put it in a silo and store it for five years. But if you get an overproduction of broccoli, it's a mess. Um, so you can't store it, right? I mean, you'd have to freeze it all. You'd have to, can uh, you know, you'd have to do something with it. So probably you have to subsidize demand in that case figure out a way to incentivize the supermarkets to sell it for less money. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I'm not a policy expert. I, I don't know how to design these things. I know where you want to end up. But that's really important work, is figuring out the policies at this really granular level that will drive 
uh, agriculture toward more climate friendly and public health um, outcomes. Uh, there are ways to do it. There's no question. Thank you. One more over here. Hi, uh, I'm Emma. I am a Cal alum and I'm an urban planner now. Uh, and my question is um, related to these conversations about concentration that we've been having and also related to Dev Patel's like stuffed and starved. And so, you know, as concentration happens, consumers have less power. So my question for you is like, what do you, it, it's a class question. It's like, what do you say to the people that, you know, if the, if the hope comes from grass-fed beef, but you walk through the supermarket in an existential crisis, as I'm sure many of us are familiar with, related to the climate, like, what do you do if you can't afford it? And, and how do you yeah. Yeah, think about that? Well, you know, affordability is a big issue, um, obviously. And we have created a system where the cheapest calories in the supermarket are the least healthy. And why is that? Because those are the calories we subsidize. Um, it's no accident. There's nothing inherently expensive about real food. Or, um, it's that we've made ultra-processed food unnaturally cheap. Um, the real cost is not reflected. So what we need to do is write that balance and make the healthier calories cheaper through, again, setting the rules. There has not been a free market in food, truly, for, you know, since... Uh, since the New Deal, basically, when we started subsidizing farmers. And we started doing that because the price to the farmers for corn in Iowa fell to zero. Um, and so we started supporting them. And ever since, it has been a game played according to rules written by the Ag Committees in Congress. There's no reason why we can't rewrite those rules and, and get the kind of outcome you want to see. So that, let's say, grass-fed beef can compete with um, industrial beef. Um, the industrial beef, again, is not paying the cost of the waste that's being produced, whereas the grass-fed beef is using the waste to fertilize the field. Um, so there's so many imbalances and, and unfairnesses about the system. Um, it's not easy to fix, but you can see a way to do it. And, and working on these policy questions, you know, you can make a tremendous, I mean, there are two things that need to happen, right? create pressure, political pressure for change, and then create interesting ideas. Uh, and they, you can trial them out in small areas and see whether we can't get the incentives right to give us the food system we want to see. Thank, thank you, so you for your question. Yeah. Let's thank Michael Pollan for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Thank you. I can't wait to see Alex's Instagram after tonight's class. Um, over to you, Viana, for quick um, attendance and uh, assignment. And grad students, remember to come down here for a few minutes after class. And Carlson's going to take you through the assignment. Hello? Yeah. Oh, I was on this whole time. Okay, everybody, so two assignments this week. The first one is the discussion board on the conversation today we have with Michael Pollan. The second one is we are going to analyze our favorite meal beyond the plate in front of, your favorite meal beyond the plate in front of you. So first, you're gonna think about your favorite meal, tell us its name, where does it come from, and why it's your favorite meal. Next, you will pick apart and list the ingredients all contained in this meal. Um, and then finally, you're gonna trace each of those individual ingredients down to where they came from. Um, and then this will be due next Tuesday, February 14th by midnight. Oh. As well as now is uh, attendance. <laughs>